Part One. John Helston, a student from London University, wants to know some information about a twenty-first conference. You'll hear a conversation between John and university staff. Now you have some time to look at questions one to five. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. University, good morning. Oh, good morning. Can you put me through to the School of Architecture, please? Certainly. School of Architecture, Professor Dawson's office. Oh, good morning. I was wondering if you could give me some information about the forthcoming Architecture Twenty First Conference, dates, enrolment procedures, costs, that sort of thing. Certainly. When exactly is the conference? Well, the conference runs for three days, from the eighteenth to the twentieth of October. Eighteenth to twentieth of October. Oh, good. I'll still be here then. And、uh, where exactly is it being held? Is it at the university, as in previous years? No, it's actually being held at the Pacific Hotel. We've rather outgrown the university conference facilities, so we've opted for this new venue. Right, Paradise Hotel. No, Pacific Hotel. Oh, right. And presumably we can get accommodation at the hotel. Yes, but you'll need to contact them direct to arrange that. I'll give you the number for hotel reservations. Have you got a pen ready? Yeah, go ahead. It's area code zero seven and then nine triple three double two double three. Okay, and what's the registration fee? Individual fees are three hundred dollars for the three days, or one hundred and twenty dollars a day if you only wanted to attend for one day. Are there any student concessions? Oh, sure. There's a fifty percent concession for students, and that's one hundred and fifty dollars for the three days, or sixty dollars a day. And am I too late to offer to give a talk? Oh, I'm pretty sure you've missed the deadline for that. Really? But I've only just arrived here in Australia. Is there any way I could have a paper accepted? Well, you'd need to talk to Professor Dawson. He's the person organising the conference this year. I can put you through if you like. Oh yes, please. That'd be great. Oh, and、uh, can I just check the spelling of his name? Is that D A W S O N? Yes, that's correct. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen carefully and answer questions six to ten. Professor Dawson speaking. Oh, hello. My name is John Helston. I'm an architecture student at London University. I'm here in Australia for three months,、uh, looking at energy-saving house designs. Right. I'm interested in giving a talk on my research at the conference, but I believe I may have missed the deadline. Well, strictly speaking, you have. The closing date was last Friday. Oh no! But we may be able to include your paper if it fits into our program. But you'll have to be quick. Okay. What do I need to do? Send me an outline of your talk, and make sure you'd include an interesting title for the talk. Something to attract the delegates' attention. Okay. Interesting title, right? The outline should be no more than three hundred words, though. Right. I should be able to keep it down to three hundred words, but would four hundred be okay? No, not really, because we have to print it in the proceedings, and we just don't have the space. Sure, I understand. And also, can you send me a short CV, the usual stuff, name, age, and qualifications, that sort of thing? Right. Include a brief CV. Actually, you can email it to me. That'd be quicker. Sure. What's your email address? 
Well, the best thing would be to send it to the conference administrative officer. The address is admin in lower case. You know, in small letters. Right. So that's admin at uniconf.edu.au. Right. I'll do that straight away. Thank you very much. You've been very helpful. Okay. Well, we hope to see you in October then. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to listen to a radio program on sleep deprivation. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. With us in the studio today are Dr Peter Collins, a senior lecturer in the Department of Psychology at the University of Chicago, and Helen Gardner, the author of the book Deep Sleep. They've come to our studio to discuss the effects of sleep deprivation and also give some tips to the sleep-deprived on how to deal with the problem. Welcome to the studio, Helen and Peter. Now, Peter, what are the reasons for sleep deprivation, and how can it affect our lives? Well, the research into sleep deprivation started in the late 50s and has been going on ever since. Many researchers link sleep deprivation with electricity, television and computers, which have enabled humans to work 24-7. Before electricity was invented, people's body clocks were synchronised with the sun's schedule and the average time they spent sleeping was 8 to 9 hours a night. By 1975, that average was down to 7 hours and today one third of us sleep less than 6 hours a day. This leads to a condition called chronic sleep deprivation which basically means going for extended periods of time with less sleep than your body needs. Chronic sleep deprivation can cause a variety of physical and psychological problems. At its most basic level, loss of sleep can make us more irritable and less efficient and can affect long-term memory and concentration, which can result in more accidents. According to the latest research into sleep deprivation, sleep deprivation is the main reason for 3% of plane crashes, 10% of domestic accidents, 20% of accidents at work and 45% of all traffic accidents. Research into the physical effects of chronic sleep deprivation suggests more serious and significant long-term complications. Research from my university, the University of Chicago, has shown that sleep deprivation interferes with how the human body regulates insulin and sugar metabolism, which can increase the risk of diabetes. People who are sleep-deprived have weakened immune systems and are more prone to viruses and other kinds of infections. People who don't get enough sleep have cognitive problems or difficulties processing and assimilating new information. Lack of sleep affects long-term memory 
and slows down such abilities as judgment and reaction times. Some researchers link sleep deprivation with obesity, indicating that sleep disorders and eating disorders are often linked. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Helen, you've done a fair amount of research for your recent book on helping people deal with sleeping problems. Could you give our listeners some tips on managing their sleep? Well, if you spend several hours a night tossing and turning in bed, trying to fall asleep, you first have to find out how much sleep you need. To do so, you'll need to try and sleep six to nine hours a night. Set aside three days for the experiment. It's best to do it on a long weekend or a holiday to ensure it doesn't get interrupted. During the experiment, you should go to bed at the same time every night and give yourself six, seven, eight or nine hours of sleep. Then monitor the way you feel throughout the day to find out how many hours of sleep you need in order to feel your best. Once you find out how much sleep you need, you can work on improving the quality of your sleep. The main secret here is to allow yourself one or two hours to relax before going to bed. You may want to try and have a warm shower or bath before going to bed. Doing some quiet activities, such as reading or filing, can help some people relax. A warm drink in bed helps to induce sleepiness. Some people take up yoga or meditation to help them relax at night. Different techniques will work for different people, so it's best to experiment and find the one that suits you best. You should definitely avoid using technology before going to bed. Activities such as playing video games, watching TV and others which require you to use your attention can stop you from falling asleep. Avoid eating before going to bed. A late dinner can disrupt your sleep. Not only is going to bed with a heavy stomach bad for digestion and can make you overweight, but it can also keep you awake for hours. Caffeine-rich drinks can increase your heart rate, which can stop you from falling asleep. Energy drinks also have the same effect on your body. You should avoid drinking these at night. The same goes for vigorous physical exercise, such as weightlifting or working out on a treadmill. In many cases, you can reset your body clock and make it tick for you by changing your lifestyle. If your sleep deprivation is severe, it's always best to seek professional advice and get an appointment with your doctor, who might prescribe you sleeping pills. Thank you, Helen. We'll be back after the break and we'll be answering questions we've received from our listeners. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. John has applied to train as a teacher and is being interviewed. In this stage of the interview, the interviewer will discuss John's previous studies and work experiences. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello. Uh, come in and take a seat. <laughs> you are uh, John Evans? Yes, I am. Well, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, the purpose of this part of the interview is to go over your CV and talk a little further about your previous studies and experiences. Yes. So, your first degree was in French, of course. Yes, with a minor in film studies. Hmm, an interesting combination. Mostly French films, presumably? Well, European cinema in general, but with a bias towards French cinema. Ah, and your degree took four years? Yes. In the third year, I was an exchange student at Bruges University in Belgium. Ah. I was there for a full academic year, nine months. Hmm, right. Well, you graduated two years ago and then you, uh, you took some time out, as it were. Yes, I spent six months as a volunteer working on restoring historic buildings in France. Oh. Was that with a well-known organisation? They're called Restoration Vacations here, but they operate under different names in several countries. I think they're quite well known. Hmm. So, uh, it was a six-month vacation, really? No, I went for a week, but really liked it, and I got asked to stay on as a translator. Oh. Because I could speak French quite well, it was my job to liaise between the owners of the buildings and the English-speaking volunteers. Hmm. That must have been a very enjoyable experience. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Well, it was certainly a very enjoyable experience to begin with, but after the first three months or so, I actually got a bit bored. Oh. I was talking about the same things every day. Bricks, cement, window frames, that kind of thing. <laughs> it wasn't really stretching my French. Also, I wasn't getting paid, just free accommodation and food plus some pocket money. Oh, I see. So then you started working for a bank in Paris. Um, uh, BCFC, I think. Uh, ah, yes. Were you doing entirely translating again? Well, translating was the major part of it, mostly from English into French this time. Official documents, letters, that kind of thing. Much more challenging. But I was also in charge of coordinating the translation work going on in the bank's offices in Switzerland, Belgium and other parts of France. Huh. What did that involve? It was simple, really. I just had to keep track of what had been translated in each office. To save wasting time having the same document translated twice in different offices. So, uh, you stayed there for a year and a half and then you left. Uh, why was that? Simple. To apply for this course. I see. Why give up a secure job in Paris to train as a teacher here? I've always imagined that I'd be a teacher, really. I loved being in Paris, but I wouldn't want to spend the rest of my life working for a bank. Ah. Do you think your experiences in France will help you as a teacher of French? It certainly helped my French, and my experiences certainly gave me a much better understanding of French culture. Mm. Although that may not be of enormous use when it comes to standing up in front of a class of British 13-year-olds. <laughs> Perhaps not. <laughs> uh, well, uh, thank you very much. The next stage of the interview will be conducted by my colleague in room 207. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part 4. Part 4. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello and welcome. My name's Carolyn Tan. Just as there are a great number of different courses and places to study here, the teaching methods used and the skills you need will vary, depending on the subject you study and the college or university you attend. All courses vary, but most include some of the teaching methods I'm going to talk about today. Generally speaking, in some subjects, you will have timetabled classes for most of the week. In others, you may only have a few hours timetabled and will be expected to work independently for a substantial amount of time. Working independently is crucial at university. I'm going to go over the three main types of teaching method you will have here. These are lectures, seminars and tutorials. There are other methods that you will come across, like workshops, group work and practical work, but I'll describe the three main types for now. I'll briefly describe what they are and try to give you some helpful advice in dealing with them. Let's start by looking at lectures. These are large classes, usually lasting around one hour, where a lecturer or tutor talks about a subject and the students take notes. On some courses, there can be over a 100 students in a lecture. Unfortunately, there is usually little or no opportunity to ask questions during the lecture. Lectures are usually intended to do three things. Firstly, to guide you through the course by explaining the main points of a topic. Secondly, to introduce new topics for further study or debate and thirdly, to give you the most up-to-date information that may not be included in textbooks. So as you can see, it's essential to go to lectures. Of course, you need to take notes in lectures. Remember, you don't need to write down everything the lecturer says. Try to concentrate on the main points and important details. Most lecturers use stories, examples and even jokes to illustrate a point and you shouldn't write these down. When you take notes in lectures, abbreviations and symbols for common words and terms can help you write faster. If there is something you don't understand, make a note to ask after the lecture or in a tutorial. Most students try to write up their notes after a lecture. It's a good idea to try to be organised. Keep your notes from your lectures in order in a file, but don't just file the notes away until your exams. Read through them regularly as this will help you with your revision. It's really important to go over your lectures. As an international student, the lecturer will recognise that you may need more help in lectures and that you may want to record the lecture on a digital recorder. If you do want to do this, ask the lecturer's permission first. They will usually agree. Finally, don't worry if you find it difficult to understand the lecturer at first. This will get easier as you get used to their style and as your English improves. OK, that's enough about lectures. Let's have a look at seminars now. Seminars are smaller classes where students and a tutor discuss a topic and they often last about the same time, if not longer than lectures. You will know in advance what the topic is and the tutor will usually ask some students to prepare a short presentation for discussion. Seminars are usually meant to encourage debate about an issue. This means different opinions will be expressed by the tutor and students. The aim is not for students to be told the correct answer, but to understand different arguments and make judgments about them. This process helps you learn to analyse topics critically. 
Some international students find that seminars can be a bit frightening, especially if they're not used to this kind of teaching. Don't worry. Many other students feel the same at first. Participating actively in seminars is an important part of the learning process, so try to contribute, even if it seems difficult at first. It is best to do some reading before each seminar, so that you are familiar with the topic and can follow and contribute to the discussion. It may help you to make notes before the seminar of any points you would like to make. If you are having difficulty in seminars, discuss this with your tutor. And finally, I'll give you information on tutorials. Tutorials are meetings between a tutor and an individual student or small group of students. These usually last between 15 and 30 minutes. In a tutorial, the tutor will give you advice and guidance on a piece of work you are doing or a piece of work you have completed, or even a problem you may be having with a topic or with study methods. You should try to ask questions during tutorials about your work or about topics raised in lectures and seminars. Well, that's all for teaching methods. I'll go on now to talk about the different kinds of examinations. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Start the day yet. I just wanna stay Even if we run late This morning let's take our time Everybody needs a break, right? Sometimes